started discussing who will be keynote speakers at this event, we had absolutely no idea that there will be a protest camp, a compound of tents just outside uh, accompanying this event and maybe even uh, coloring it in a different way. Nevertheless, I think we invited the most appropriate keynote speaker to make a connection between subjects discussed inside this hall and matters and developments occurring just outside, adjacent to this hall. I think we're honored and we will all be very, very much enriched by listening to the keynote opening talk by Professor Yuchai Benkler from Harvard University. Yuchai will make... Yuchai will make, so I am sure, the connections between what we all think about care about and invest in all the way to this morning's headlines. It has always been a very important part of Wikimedia and Wikipedia to correspond with ongoing modes of thought. The connection between knowledge, its value, and its price the role of economic models, the role of regulation, the role of government involvement. All of these have always played an important role and helped shape the values of neutral point of view and good faith and the like. Never have such deep thoughts been recorded as well as in Yuchai's previous book, the wealth of networks, in which the achievements of Wikipedia were already celebrated early on in the progress of this movement. Yuchai is uh, going to see the publication of his next book, what is it, next week? Next week, and in some ways, his next book is a second round, and I would hope, a statement of triumph of some of the values that we all hold. Uh, I'm not going to steal his message, but I am going to say that, uh, what is it, coming up uh, next year, the date where your famous bet with Nicholas Carr will uh, finally come to uh, fruition. Uh, so maybe this can be the first celebration of Yuchai's uh, unambiguous victory in that bet. And it's uh, a, a delight uh, on my part to have Yuchai and have an opportunity to have a sneak peek to his uh, current thinking. Those of you who haven't seen it, there's a special issue of Harvard Business Review where some of this stuff is written down for those of us who prefer writing. Uh, and one more announcement before uh, I officially invite Yuchai, just to remind everyone that after Yuchai's talk, we will split into two tracks. There will be a continuation in this hall, and there will be a continuation at the beginning of the Israeli Wiki Academy in the Cinema Tech Hall, beginning following Yuchai's talk. Folks, join me in welcoming you, Hi Begler, for the opening keynote talk of Wikimedia 2011. <coughs> Sorry, it's um, uh, it's extremely exciting and a real privilege to be able to come and talk uh, here uh, at Wikimania 2011 uh, in Haifa um, to this um, uh, incredibly exciting and large uh, um, uh, meeting of uh, some of the people who I think really give the world an inspiration about what is possible for human beings to do together. Um, we're meeting, as, as Shezaf said, uh, right outside, uh, people are standing, sitting in tents, trying to claw back a sense of what a decent society and what a decent community can be within a market system, beyond simply maximizing the returns to capital. We're sitting barely a few hundred kilometers southeast 
of where braving enormous threats, Syrians are going out and asking for their dignity to be recognized, for their humanity to be recognized against overwhelming threats that I think very few, if any of us, can really imagine what they might be like. And perhaps it's cheapening that effort to connect it to you, to us, to what we do, but I don't think it's disconnected. I think the Arab Spring that brings forth this effort, I think the movement of outside brings together not only we focus on Facebook or Twitter or how people connect to each other uh, technically to get together, but not that. It's the understanding of the capacity to work together to overcome structures of hierarchy, structures of markets that necessarily reduce us to supply and demand curves, to say we can share in our common humanity to do something together, be it create a body of knowledge for the world or create our own democracies. And that's really very much of what's been uh, 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 my focus in the last few years. When I first uh, wrote about uh, Wikipedia, it was, actually, it was exactly 10 years ago. It was in the summer of 2001. Wikipedia, as you can imagine, had about 2,000 uh, uh, articles. Um, and I was responding to a moment in uh, the intellectual debate, particularly in economics, uh, uh, in uh, the United States in particular, that had, was trying to understand what the story was with open source software, with free software that had just really come into people's field of vision a couple of years earlier. And the basic answer was, there's this weird tribe of people, they're called hackers, they're really weird, don't pay attention to them, uh, or there's this really bizarre thing called software, it's so quirky, people produce it in a way that no one ever could. But ignore all of that, because we know what the real uh, model is, and that's a market for people who respond to incentives, go off the prices, and produce things at a quality. And the thing that really happens is, you get more efficient markets from the net. And what I wrote in that piece in Cosmos Penguin uh, 10 years ago was, no, actually, free software is just the beginning. What we're seeing instead is a massive decentralization and creation of a new modality of production online. And I'll speak for the first five to seven minutes uh, about that moment, um, <clears throat> where people actually can come together and create together in a third modality of production alongside markets and the state. And where I am today is trying to understand essentially is it just about what we can do on the net? A lot of the first half of this de past decade was, is this real? Will it survive? And for that, it was important to generate reasons to believe that there was something special about this space called the network environment that made it possible what we knew to be impossible elsewhere. Well, today we're older. Today, anyone who still asks the question of is it possible can be ignored because of you. The next question is, does it stop at the door of the net? And the answer out there is no. So the question is how we connect these two, and that's really what I'm trying to do, um, and what I'll start talking about uh, today. So, <clears throat> there have been people trying to build, uh, uh, there have been people trying to build uh, amateur uh, cars uh, for a long time. They've never threatened uh, uh, they've never threatened GM or Toyota because of the core physical capital necessary to produce an assembly. The same was thought to be uh, with this uh, uh, thing. So pretty cool business model, 32 volumes, leather bound, several thousand dollars, you have to buy it. Um, and the revolution, two of the greatest information economists of the 1990s, um, wrote this book, Information Rules, and in their second chapter they said, Here's, if you want to understand what the future of the net is, look at Encarta. It is going to change everything. Because if that's the new one. You see, 39.95 in 2000, that's going to change. It's going to be integrated with the operating system. It's about network effects. It's about richness and interactivity. And in fact, lo and behold, uh, in 1998, Britannica has only $500 in 12 volumes. 
And several years later, Shale Chains by Cheapsoftware.com, uh, $29.95. But of course, that framework was simply unable to understand that which everyone sees their own vision in. You, Wikipedia. Because it was impossible. It was impossible. And yet, it moves. And as it moves, it changes everything for all of us. What I came to learn as I thought about these things, what I think many of us today understand, and this was the core when I spoke at, at, uh, five years ago at Wikimania in Cambridge. Um, uh, this was what I focused about. This was the message that we learned that was special about the net, and I think is still true about the net, but it's not enough, as I'll, as I'll uh, say when I'm, uh, uh, by the time I'm done. The most important inputs into the core economic uh, uh, activities of the most advanced economies are widely distributed in the population. Both material, computation, communication, storage, sensing, uh, uh, capture, and human insight, experience, uh, creativity, perspective, presence, as well as the social capabilities able to put, get us together and develop processes. Essentially what happens is that the same behaviors that we've always had as human beings, but have been peripheral to the economy, as human beings in society, social motivations, cooperation, friendship, etc., moved from being important to who we are as social beings, but peripheral to who we are in organized society, in the market, in the state, to becoming an increasingly important part of who we are in the market, in the state, in the production system, not the market uh, and the state. Essentially, if you think along dimensions of centralized versus de decentralized and market-based versus non-market-based, we can think of four major transactional systems or frameworks. The price system, firms, governments, and organized nonprofits, and families, friends, localized efforts in the social economy. And essentially, throughout the industrialized period, because of the high cost of capital, the bottom is what was occupied. Centralized capacity to raise enough capital to be effective, like that GM plant, um, and, uh, 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 and the rest was more in the periphery. Essentially what we've seen <clears throat> in the last decade, decade plus, as the legitimacy of decentralized network production rises, we see all three quadrants moving to accept the rise of network-based social sharing and exchange, both on its own two feet, like Wikipedia, and in processes with all of the others as it stops being a puzzle and starts becoming a solution space. So if you think of uh, classic things like Wikipedia or like uh, GNU Linux or like PHP or, or whatever it is that you want to see up in the quadrant of social network, of, of, um, uh, of network uh, social uh, organization, we see that. But we also see its integration into the other systems. We see efforts like Citizens Connect, like Transparency in the Sunlight Foundation, to actually um, uh, combine networked social motivation with the nonprofit or the government and participation in government. We see some big firms trying to connect to free and open source software, the classic example, the most integrated ones. We see smaller firms essentially leveraging the creative or insight or opinions of people all around uh, the world into what are new uh, uh, entrepreneurial models that then eventually obviously grow and move to the bottom quadrant uh, of centralized firms. But the critical point at this point that I want to make is that networked social production, peer production, has moved from being a puzzle that can be ignored to being a central part of the solution space for whole classes of problems. And obviously it doesn't happen only at one level, it's not only about knowledge. And you see integration of multiple layers of, of recursive cooperation generating solutions. If you look at Mushahidi, for example, what do you have? You have a Kenyan mother putting on a, 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 
request. Look, we have violence here. Let's find the utility that actually allows us to identify them. Then you've got uh, expats, Kenyan expat in the US developing things. Somebody else checking in and say, actually you have to make it focused on mobile phones because that's the only internet connectivity or only real connectivity there is. And within less than a week you have a model that's free software, up and running, integrating at that software layer all the contributions of creativity on top of it. Um, uh, uh, a model of reporting on violence that's about everybody observing and then connecting, matching it up with maps that again give real-time information. And what moves from an ad hoc solution to the Kenyan violence through the fact that it is open, available for creativity and modeled on distributed cooperation becomes the foundation of what is in many senses the future of disaster response or needed disaster response everywhere. Whether it's fires in Russia that the authorities don't look after, or whether it's snowstorms in Washington, D.C., where residents are trying to basically say, here, this street is blocked. They're using this Kenyan development system, developed system because of its recursive use of cooperation from the technical layer to generating the information to then distributing it all free and freely shared on a model that is truly global. That's the power, and it's become now the solution space. <clears throat> the other thing that happened is in 2006, I put this slide up and said, here's the moment at which mainstream media suddenly understand that to capture what is going on in the world, you can't believe that you'll just add money and more reporters on the ground, because we all have these capture devices with us, and the only images from the London underground bombing were of people in the, for in the subway. And then BBC, to their credit, took it and introduced it as the central part of their production. By the time of the images from uh, Tahrir, this was already integrated. This was what the, what the world was looking at, was a collaboration between, on one hand, people on the ground telling their stories and on the other hand, traditional media, knowing that this is where they need to go, amplifying and generalizing. And this interplay, people talk about the Facebook revolution, but the interplay between the role that Facebook on one hand played for people, and on the other hand, Al Jazeera played for generalizing into the Arab world, is the thing that we need to start to understand and learn. How this thing that was a unique nature preserve becomes integrated as a third modality of production together with market organizations that are beginning to open up, together with governments that are trying to uh, open up, creating new models of both governance and production that enable not a perfect world, but a substantially more open framework to allow people to actually participate in generating their message. And we see this, as I said, in all sorts of places. So the question that I want to ask is, can it be only online, and how can we systemize the design of cooperative systems? And the answer to question one will be, of course not. And the answer to question two will be, I don't know. Well, hopefully it'll be a little better than I don't know. Um, uh, but rather it'll be, here's how we need to start systematizing it, and here's how we need to change fundamentally the way our baseline attitude towards who we are as human beings as part of the solution to uh, uh, how we can begin to uh, develop cooperative systems. So let's go to one of the more extreme versions of uh, the rational actor model. So Gary Becker, Nobel uh, laureate in economics, uh, in 1968, instituted this move towards trying to explain human behavior beyond the market in terms of rational cost-benefit calculation, when he said that deterrence equals the penalty times the probability of detection. You either raise the penalty, which is what we have in the US with, with, three, with three strikes and you're out, or you raise the probability of, of detection by increasing more police, or you do both, both, and if you do that, you'll succeed. On the other hand, what we saw is the rise since the 1980s in the US of community policing. So on one hand, you have the efforts to really raise deterrence for which there's no evidence it's actually worked. And on the other, you have an effort to build a completely different organizational model 
that's built on a completely different conception of what the problem is. Instead of 911 call, technically, you walk rather than in a car. You meet people face to face, you talk to them, you try to understand. Organization, instead of just answering emergency calls so that all you meet are either victims or perpetrators, you have connected meetings all the time to try to understand what the problems are, where the problems are. You try to learn from people. You build a community relation between the police and the uh, community. Institutionally, you change, you give more discretion to the cops to what is it to focus. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not what you think. Maybe the thing that really matters is uh, making sure that particular part is clean and, and, and works and worthwhile because that's a source of other things. And finally, social, the humanization, the changing of the us-them boundaries on both sides and the creation of the connection between the two. So we see it, and community policing today is, is in, in, in uh, 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 the majority of mid-scale and larger communities in the United States is considered a massively uh, successful program and in that regard is much more successful than the model based on higher penalties. Um, if we move from the state and its relations that can be organized on a model of the Leviathan of control and penalty and detection versus the penguin, uh, as it were, the, the, the relationship that, that's human, uh, we see it even more powerfully in business. And few organizations embody this model better than General Motors did uh, for decades. Uh, and it starts, and this really typifies the 20th century thinking of organization, it starts with Frederick Taylor's principles of scientific management 100 years ago, 170 years, five years ago, that basically said, let's try to minimize the discretion of people to make sure that we get a very accurate production cycle and have lots of process engineers measuring each movement, giving exact instructions of what to do, and then Ford embeds that in the assembly line and we get the contemporary industrial uh, model that we understand on the shop floor. That's at the shop floor. Why? Because the problem, as another Nobel laureate in economics, Oliver Williamson, uh, wrote, the core advantage of the firm is that it can monitor shirking. And the basic assumption is everyone shirts. People on the shop floor shirk, suppliers shirk, managers shirk, and you can build a coherent organization top to bottom based on the theory that people are self-interested and materially driven. So at the bottom, what do you do? You create very precise motions. You have a lot of monitors looking at what people do. You reward and punish based on whether you do it correctly and you fill your quota or you don't. With suppliers, what do you do? You don't create relations of trust over a long time. You always throw to competitive bidding because they'll always try to say the cost is higher, they'll charge more if there's a long-term relationship. Instead, just competitive bidding, put it in the market. And at the top, what do you do? Well, who's going to monitor the person at the top? No one can monitor them, so therefore you give them stock options. You give them stock options so that if the stockholders do well, they do well as well. We know how well that works. This is the model of GM. Now, Essentially, what, by the 1990s, this became such a widespread accepted knowledge that, that we saw more and more models moving toward the price system. So firms started to have internal markets, governments started to rely on market-based mechanism on outsourcing certain government functions, maybe private schools would be better, commercial schools, maybe something else would be better. We even began to understand questions of family and friends in terms of incentives and getting the incentives right. That was the language we were developing. And then 2008, and my favorite quote from Alan Greenspan in the House hearings was, I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, were such as that they were the best capable of protecting their own shareholders. For 40 years we held on to this belief in self-interest. It was mathematically proved, it was good, it was a decent predictor, that's how we need to think. But that was the central model. But the other model was there all along. So essentially, for a while people thought, well, Japanese production in the 70s was very different. And again, like the hackers, it's a different weird tribe. They do things differently. And then, 30 years ago already, in the US, a major experiment occurred that should have shaken things and did to some extent, but not completely, which is GM's, one of GM's worst performing plants shut down was opened two years later under management by Toyota. Same employees, same union, same union leadership, but instead of 70 process engineers on the shop floor, none. 
Instead of one person working at each station, teams of four or five continuously improving and talking about what they could do differently for their station. A lot more flexibility, a lot more autonomy. Within two years, it became the most productive plant in the U.S. and has stayed that way, and stayed that way for over 30 years with very high employee uh, uh, um, uh, satisfaction. Leading to what became Toyota production system is something that is taught all across businesses. You would have thought that that would be uh, the, the solution and things would change. But of course, still tagged as something very special with all sorts of other things because the core belief, the core ideology in self-interest was too strong. And the same obviously happened in that regard with differences in supply relationships, differences in, in uh, uh, pay. These are the two images of the two um, um, uh, chairmen, uh, of the two CEOs of the two companies scaled to their salaries in 2006. Um, uh, needless to say, it wasn't necessarily uh, uh, for performance. Although there were enough problems with how Huda ran uh, the order that are responsible for today's, for today's problems. But essentially what we got was two models, a model of hierarchy plus high power intensity incentives at the top versus a model of lower power incentives, longer trust-based relationships, more autonomy on the shop floor as an alternative model. So essentially what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting that what we came to learn from Wikipedia about Britannica is something that in the background We've been seeing for 20 or 30 years in practice, though not acknowledged in theory, from community police, from, from in policing, in uh, some sectors of organizational management, but always done somehow apologetically, always expressed somehow without a core belief, because it ran so contrary to the dominant model of material self interest. So essentially, the challenge, the next round, of what is the big thing we need to take from Wikipedia, from the network uh, information environment, from peer production, is that we need an integrated approach across lots of domains, not only technical, but organizational, institutional, and social, mutually reinforced design characteristics based on the best evidence we have to build systems for people who are like us. And what does it mean, people who are like us? Well, here what we have is an intellectual art in many, many uh, uh, areas of, of study that moves from a period of late 50s through late 80s of refining and perfecting self-interest as a model to over the last 15, 10 to 15 years, a re-emergence of cooperation. We see it in evolutionary biology, we see it even in economics, we certainly see it in political theory, from, from Downs and Olson and Hardin in the 1950s and 60s, talking about just maximizing self-interest to the political system, uh, in management science and organizational sociology we already talked about. One way of capturing this change is to compare these two quotes uh, from uh, leading biologists. One in 1976, Richard Dawkins was the selfish gene. Be warned that if you wish, as I do, to build a society in which individuals cooperate generously and unselfishly towards a common good, you can expect little help from biological nature. Let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. Let us understand what our own selfish genes are up to because we may then at least have the chance to upset their designs, something which no other species has ever inspired to do. He wants us to be altruistic and cooperative. But he believes that we are not, and that we need to resist. 30 years later, Martin Novak writes in, in Science, perhaps the most remarkable aspect of evolution is its ability to generate cooperation in a competitive world. Thus, we might add natural cooperation as a third fundamental principle of evolution beside mutation and natural selection. That's a shift in the discipline. Not because Dawkins didn't know what he was talking about. So this particular line may be a little unfair to draw out because it's not that he didn't know that there was already in evolution a lot about sharing, but most of the sharing and cooperation was explained purely in terms of reciprocity, particularly direct reciprocity. You scratch my neck, I scratch yours. Tick for tack. That was the state of the discipline. You could explain all cooperation just in terms of the direct material payoff. Um, but this change essentially replicates this uh, classic argument in evolutionary biology between Herbert Spencer, who, who uh, uh, characterized social Darwinism and the term of survival of the fittest, 
as a justification for laissez-faire capitalism, right? As secular ways of looking at the world replace the dominance of religion, we went to science to seek insight about who we really are. And the most important response to social Darwinism and academically was actually the development of anthropology. So Franz Boas, Margaret Mead, uh, people who pushed against nature and talked about nurture and talked about culture. But even within biology, Kropotkin, in, uh, uh, in mutual aid, uses evolutionary biology to say, no, actually we see mutual cooperation. So we see, a hundred years ago, this clash between two views of evolution. We see the ultimate dominance of the selfish view, and now the reemergence of a cooperative view. But that's not going to lead us to actually know how to build systems. What it does do, and it gets replicated now in all sorts of studies, so you see studies um, uh, uh, MRI images of empathy. So this is a study basically showing, uh, 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 by Tanya Singer and others, uh, basically showing that when you take a couple and you shock one of them with a, uh, a mild shock, their brain lights up in one way, and then when you shock their partner, their brain lights up in almost the same way, except for a particular portion that actually processes the pain. But they actually physically feel the pain. At least that's the model in the brain. Um, People running experiments with, with oxytocin, so this is the classic model of a bowl, uh, uh, and there are monogamous bowls that have long-term relationships and polygamous bowls that don't, and there are big differences in their oxytocin uptake. So people are talking about the role of particular neurochemicals in generating uh, 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 a sense of trust and trust uh, uh, and trustworthiness. What you see throughout all of these studies is an increasing range of evidence that first of all, in some sense, challenges this whole altruism selfishness. Does it, are we really altruistic if we get a kick out of cooperating with others? The answer is, who cares? It's who we are. <laughs> of course, much more uh, practical, but still very far from practical application. But a much richer set of, of, of materials comes to us from psychology, from sociology, from anthropology, um, and a hyper-simplistic way of putting it, but at least hyper-simplistic, less so than the idea that we just care about material interest and we're universally self-interested, uh, is to think of us as having multiple dimensions or multiple vectors pushing on our motivation. Material interests that economics talks about, moral commitments, emotional needs and effective responses, and social motivation, some of which are more practical, like functional social capital, I'll do you a favor today, that gets me some probability of a favor in the back uh, later on, more functional. Some of it much more about uh, learning behavior from others, seeing what others do, copying, learning what's the right way to do in social networks. Some of it on solidarity, in a sense of, of what some might call in-group bias, of saying part of my identity is we, not only I. And so I do things for the we as well as for the I. Learn the centrality of the situation, the frame, the system within which I am, and the potential for crowding out, and this is critical. When you try to do things, when you, you can't just add money to an interaction. You can't go to dinner at friends and leave a check on the table at the end and expect that you'll be invited more often. It doesn't work that way. Um, these things can compete with each other. And in each of these uh, disciplines, the critical thing I want to put to you is that in each of these disciplines, over the last 15 years or so, there's been work that increasingly says who are we? We are people who are, who do have material interests. We do care about putting bread on the table. And that does motivate us. But that's far from all who we are. We are moral beings who care about doing the right thing. We are social beings who care about connecting with other people. We are emotional beings that have emotional responses to something and say, this is what I want to do in this thing. This is what I want. And we need to build all of these into our model of motivation. And because, A, many of us are different from each other. One of the things you see repeatedly in the experimental work that's being done is that there's some portion of people, a gestalt number might be about 30%, who do behave like homo economicus. That's a lot. You might need quite a few of them, but it's not a majority. And there are others who will systematically be altruistic, maybe 15 to 20%. That's a lot of them. You'll meet them too. And then there are a lot of people in the middle who are extremely sensitive to the context and might be one or might be the other depending on what. 
The core thing I want, uh, uh, if anything, uh, to come out from a design perspective here is that for a long time when we, eat, when we internalized the fact that we should look at the world through self-interest and rationality, get the incentives right, we were building the world for everyone for what was optimized for maybe 30% of us. At the expense, and this is the critical point, of denying the self-motivated possibilities from 70% of us. So how many people told you that this was crazy and would never work? Can you count them? You can't count them. 30% <laughs> was Jimmy's answer. <laughs> you win. But in so many ways. Um, impossible. And yet it is. So, what do we need to do? Um, what we need to do is um, uh, understand two things. Let me actually just put these up. What we need to do is two major things. We, as people who talk about how we should know ourselves in the world. The first is concept conceptual. From accepting that rationality means, or at least is well modeled by accepting that everyone has more or less the same motivation structure, and that motivation structure is reasonably well modeled by material self-interest. Two, understanding that we are quite different and quite varied, both among each other and in different contexts. There are different moments of life, different moments of a week, where we might be more self-interested and less so, more sensitive to social motivations and less so, uh, that we are diverse internally and among us, that we are, and that the preponderance of us are motivated much of the time by pro-social human, uh, uh, humanity, a pro-social sense of being together. So the first is conceptual, beginning to really let go. Wikipedia is not a puzzle. Wikipedia is who we are. The puzzle is why we allowed ourselves to build for so long systems that depended either on hierarchical monitoring or on markets, and instead of rejecting them as insufficient to occupy all of who we are, embracing them as refined, rational, scientific ways of designing systems for who we are. And the second, and intellectually much harder now, although in some senses perhaps uh, emotionally less difficult or historically less difficult, is to, is to focus on design, on designing cooperative human systems based on behaviorally realistic things that come out of actual observation in the field, out of experiments, out of uh, uh, anthropological work, historical work, behaviorally realistic, evidence-based design, integrating multiple disciplines susceptible to testing and implementation, whose building blocks are communication or framing in the situation, who matters, I, thou, we, zen, empathy, and solidarity, who is right, what is right, what is fair, and what is normal for the particular situation, accepting that calculation matters, that material and social rela uh, uh, relations also matter, uh, and critically, and I'll spend a few minutes on this after uh, this slide, subject to potential negative interactions between material punishment or reward and social relation motivations, and a variety of other social, uh, uh, social uh, dynamics uh, that we all know are critical and we need to learn more about, trust, transparency, reputation, social networks, leadership, asymmetric contribution, the fact that it's not free riding when some people contribute a lot and some people contribute less. It's the way a system works if it's going to work because some people are more motivated on this dimension, there's a different role that you play. I don't need to tell you, I, 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 Jimmy was saying yesterday, the one place that he stands up and he knows that everybody in the room knows more about Wikipedia than he does. Uh, I certainly will stand here in this room and accept and embrace uh, uh, that fact. Um, um, but all of these things need to be integrated into how we build the future so that we're not doing hit or miss that we be begin to connect our design interventions with the basic science of human motivation. Critical to uh, understanding the importance of uh, designing based on our understandings of social and, and, and moral motivations is understanding that you can't just add money. 
Um, because if that's not true, then in principle the economists are still happy. Everything else in the mess, just add money and you'll increase and decrease motivation. The roots of this debate are very old um, uh, and classic in, in, in the Fitmus Arrow debates of 1771. Richard Fitmus wrote a book about blood donations. The UK system was all volunteer, the US systems were primarily paid. UK systems had fewer uh, uh, failures in supply and fewer contaminations. US had more. And Fitmus wrote that that was because essentially good donors were being driven out by the monetary incentives in the US system and, um, uh, and uh, uh, bad uh, donors were being brought in. Kenneth Arrow, major economist, Nobel laureate, said, no, 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 you're getting it wrong. Maybe the money is drawing in bad guys. But the motivations of the people who want to donate are completely independent. They've got nothing to do with it. And since then, we've had decades of experiments which the major meta-analyses suggest say the evidence is on Fitness's side, not on Arrow's side. What might be the mechanism? So if you remember what I talked about with regard to the various vectors, if you just think of them as, as directed forces pushing us towards certain actions, if you imagine the standard debate, basically it says material interests will go to give uh, blood, moral commitments maybe go to give blood, but social connections and signals, if pe people are paid, why am I doing this really? Do people think that I'm doing this for purposes of being a good person? Do I signal to myself that I'm a good person by doing this? Not really, because there's a market for it. So that essentially, if you take away the material interest, you lose the drive to give blood, but you gain much stronger a sense that it's the right thing to do, much stronger of a sense that it's socially the right thing to do, and, and much more of a sense of yourself, of the kind of person you are. I do certain things, that is what makes me virtuous. That is how I know that I am virtuous. That's the, uh, that's the affective model. Um, a nice study in 2008 actually tried to uh, uh, measure this specifically in blood. Most of the other studies were in other uh, things. Uh, done in Sweden, where the baseline is, is uh, voluntary donation, essentially uh, uh, donors were, being paid, were paid 50 krona in order to um, uh, um, register for donating blood. And what the uh, researchers found is that, uh, in fact, you got a decline from 52% donation to 30, uh, although the, the uh, numbers for everyone were not statistically significant, they were only significant for women. So then they said, well, what if it's social signaling? What if they let people donate it back? And in fact, what happened is that all of the motivation suddenly aligned, and you came back to the original level of contribution. Interestingly, you didn't actually get more contribution. So all of the transaction of giving money and having the money given away didn't affect overall levels of contribution. What it did do was it at least showed us, you could actually glimpse how even in this era that's the classic debate, material interests actually undermine motivation, but in ways that we don't fully understand yet, in ways that seem to work much more importantly for women than for men. In that particular study, maybe if we replicate the gender effect will change. There's a lot of fascinating work done now about, about uh, gender differences uh, in this model, um, uh, and that's the model that we're talking about. So what we're looking for, again, as I said, Behavioral realistic, evidence-based design, integrating multiple disciplines, susceptible to testing and implementation. And that's what I would talk about. So then we've got communication. Right, so absolutely central in all the experiences of communication is not cheap talk, the way economists like to talk about it, but it's actually central. And obviously, um, um, I, I don't need to tell you. I love this one. What does hmm do in a text? You can't actually read that without hearing a human voice, can you? Hmm. There's a humanization that occurs before anything else in the act of communication. And through it, so much more as well. Communication is absolutely central. And as we're beginning to see more places trying to actually systematize social software and design for, co uh, for cooperation, we begin to see, like, for example, uh, here in this, uh, yeah, uh, 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 how to is talk like a person. Right? Talk, first of all, and talk like a person. The idea that what you're trying to do is make sure instead of rationalizing so that you ignore the person and, I ca and create incentives for somebody who's a utility curve, talk like a person, communicate. 
We see it across again. What I want to get across is this is somehow that we're the systems that we build don't fit. So in reality, people are pushing against them across many dimensions, trying to build better systems. We haven't yet quite developed an intellectual way of talking about it that is anywhere like the equivalent, either in its precision or in its general uh, acceptance and application as a basic cultural assumptions that the rational actor model does. And that's what we need to build. So we have litigation, where there's a lot of arm's length, counsel, defendant, your honor, great distance, and a great movement. And as you read, if you read mediation handbooks, what you see, the first thing is sit like human beings and talk. And let people talk about what they want to talk about. And obviously we see this um, um, uh, in Wikipedia as well. Framing, absolutely critical. Another beautiful experiment by Lee Ross and, and several other uh, collaborators done both in the US uh, and Israel. Essentially they took a prisoner's dilemma game and uh, the same exact incentive, if people cooperate, they both go home with something. If both defect, they go home with a lot less. If one cooperates and one defects, the one who cooperates goes home with worse payoff and the one who defects takes everything. And that supposedly captures a lot of situations that we're in um, where people can cooperate and then be taking advantage of uh, or not. The thing is, the only thing under the traditional model that should matter is what's actually the incentives, what's the payoff to the different behaviors. So they took a group of students in the US, a group of pilots in Israel, uh, uh, Air Force pilots in Israel, and they basically put them in a context where they gave them the exact same game. They told one group that they were playing the community game. They told the other group they were playing the Wall Street game. The group who played the Wall Street game, 30% open cooperating and didn't quite sustain cooperation over the course of the game. The group that was told they were playing the community game, 70% played cooperative and sustained cooperation throughout the period. Why? We don't quite know. Probably they thought it was the right thing to do. To some extent, they thought there was less of a risk that people would take advantage of them, and so they actually did what they wanted to do, which is cooperate. Uh, and interestingly, which one of these you told them they were playing, even though they had the identical setup, was more predictive than when they asked their teachers or their dorm masters or, their, or their, their commanders in the army what they predict for each person would do. Because once they moved out of whatever context they were and they were that kind of person, into a context where they were told, this is the Wall Street. Okay, I'm supposed to make a lot of money. Okay, I'm going to try to do that. Um, but to me, this captures also so much of what's at stake in getting the right understanding. Moving from a world in which we design for everyone and make them mostly behave like those 25 or 30 percent or however many they are, in this case, 30 percent, to a world in which we design for us and also are worried and concerned about making sure that some people won't take advantage of it. I, mean, I don't need to tell you what it means to protect this commons from people who want to abuse it. So much of the work goes on. It's not that it's not important. It can't be the pure organizing theme. That's the critical point. Empathy plays a very large role. In that regard, one of the, my favorite uh, uh, experiments was done by Iris Bonnet and Bruno Frey at, at, in Zurich. Um, uh, they had a dictator. Essentially, they gave one set of people some money, and they said, you can give to those other people as much or as little as you like in a closed envelope. No one will know what you gave, and no one will know who got it. There's zero incentive to give anything. When it was completely anonymous, 26% of the endowment was actually transferred, on average. 28% gave nothing. So interestingly, even when there was absolutely nothing at stake, only 28% gave nothing, instead of just walking away as the traditional model would predict. When all they did was say, stand up, each one of the people in the other crowd. You don't know who's giving to you, but the people who are in the giver side actually see the face of the person who they will or won't be uh, 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 defecting, who they will or won't be sending home saying, I won't give you anything. Only 11% after this gave nothing. All they saw was a face. And when they got a little more information about the hobbies are, who the person is, what they do. Again, there's no accountability. No one knows what you give. None gave zero. None. And 50% of the endowment was, uh, uh, was handed over. Pure empathy. And of course, we see this, right? Look at you. You're all here face to face, meeting the other human being. 
People fly for thousands of miles to meet face to face on a business transaction that has all the big contracts in the world around it. And yet there's the sense of the face to face communication, the sense of the common humanity that needs to be exchanged with food sharing uh, wherever we do it. And obviously, again, I don't need to tell you, you need to teach me about how central uh, the sense of self is and knowing who the other person is. Then there's the question of group identity or solidarity. And then there's a lot of work going back since the 1970s looking experimentally uh, at the role. There's work uh, uh, in, in economics, uh, Sam Bowles and Herb Gintes in anthropology, uh, Rob Boyd and Steve Richardson. Um, some of it looking at evolution, some of it looking uh, uh, in political science, essentially showing that people are incredibly connected with each other and actually work uh, 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 and contribute more. So if you've got SETI at home, uh, the night you say me used to be when this thing still ran separately, uh, one of the groups uh, uh, that had particularly high contributions uh, and developed their own sites. But like many other things, cooperate doesn't mean nice. Cooperate means non-selfish. Group solidarity is not necessarily always a good thing. It's very often in-group bias against the other. So none of these, my point is, cooperation doesn't always mean nice. Self-sacrifice can be the suicide bomber every bit as much as everything else. We need to be cautious. We need to channel all of these pro-social motivations towards things that we, as human beings, talking about how the world ought to be, um, uh, uh, can channel nationalism, for example, into uh, positive avenues uh, like uh, soccer. Um, people don't think that it's a positive avenue. <laughs> um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a taste. There's more work on people really caring about what's right, Again, I don't need to tell you about how important it's been. When, when I wrote in August of 2001, when I wrote the first draft of Cozen's Penguin and sent it into Jamie Ball's uh, uh, conference on the public domain, um, what I saw about Wikipedia was unique at the time, was that it was not a platform that was like a, a, that was designed for self-interested people. Slashdot, the other great major thing at the time that was clearly distributed, was built like a game design to make sure that nobody could game the system too much. Wikipedia was, we have a set of norms, we built around them. Now since then you've grown, a lot more institutionally has, has grown. These three days are full of studies about the complexities of what it means to translate from this simple core appeal to doing what's right, and here's the definition of what's right here, to actually managing it in such a large scale. It is an amazing experiment that you're running here, that nobody's run. But this core point that we think of from the start was about norms, about doing what's right within this framework. And if you want to do something else, go elsewhere. And do it there, you're free to do that. Uh, has been absolutely central. Etc. 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 Fairness turns out to be really important. Again, we have a lot of experimental evidence. Uh, conformism matters. Normal, just telling people what's normal. And one of my favorite little things in a study we did on voluntary donation systems, uh, uh, this was magnitude at a time that basically they released the music um, uh, of, of hundreds of artists under Creative Commons perfectly. You could just make copies and it was legal. Um, for five years of data, what we have is 50%, 48.05% of people who downloaded the music paid eight bucks voluntarily for an album because they were told that was a typical thing to do. It's not a mistake, right? 850, 0.34% are giving. People choose to be either typical or better than average, 12.19% or generous. People take cues of saying, here's what's normal for us. Our habit of action together is thus, and so we develop this virtue. So I think what we're seeing, but what we also need to be really active in pursuing is the retreat of scientific selfishness. Scientific policymaking keeps pushing back on widespread cultural norms of sharing. But the actual practices in the network environment and increasingly in businesses revive this idea of sharing nicely, this broad social educational bent with which we infuse our child rearing practices as something that's very real for how we live. 
Diverse businesses and social production models begin to challenge efficiency, efficacy, and growth-oriented effects of scientific selfishness. Science itself is beginning to push back with theoretical, experimental, and observational work. I think what we're seeing is the development of what doesn't quite know itself yet as a new field of cooperative human systems design. But perhaps most importantly, and here we come back to the tents outside and to the people hundreds of kilometers northeast from here, a renewed view of our shared humanity, not at arm's length from each other, but as people who actually care about being social human beings. Thank you. So those of us tweeting uh, away, uh, two points that I take away. Yochai, one is, and yet it moves. Maybe a challenge uh, for Jimmy's talk on Saturday, where he's going to, at least so promised, address the issue of will continue to move. And the other is the retreat of scientific selfishness. Uh, we were promised 125 talks, so it's one down and 124 to go. <laughs> oh, sorry? <laughs> uh, so let's just go ahead. There's a short break, and we reconvene here and in the small cinema tech hall for the Wiki Academy meetings. Thanks again, Yochai, for a wonderful time. <laughs>